Can you believe the ICF are having a birthday party and they haven't invited me? I cannot believe the Rangers Intercity Firm are having a celebration and they haven't invited one of their top boys. Well, top boy for 1987. All right, for two weeks in 1987. Okay, I wasn't actually a top boy, more of a more of a tall boy. All right, I didn't actually know ending the ICF, but the thing is, in the days with the, the terrace and the away grounds, you could sneak up behind them when they were too busy baiting the opposition fans. You could listen in and you could hear all the top boys talking to each other and I could work out their names and maybe take me Polaroid photographs and stick them around my mirror in my bedroom and I would fantasise about the time I'd go up and introduce myself to the lovely, tough, muscly boys for the ICF. With The, the thing is, it turned out you had to be really good at uh, fighting, <laughs> or, if, or if not that, then running away, and even though I was really skinny back then, I was still as slow as a week in the jail. Or you need to have a good dress sense, and uh, I tell them Gola was going to come back into fashion, but they wouldn't have it. The thing is, I could do a job for them now. I've, I've, I've got I've got my lump on, like they say in the Essex films. I mean, sort of like they say when I'm when I'm doing the gym. I've, I've bulked up, you know. I've taken on some calories, and it's sort of slipped into my waist. But you know, I could when they're getting chased by the busies, the, the, the popo, the, the old bill, the, the nine one. When they're getting chased by the the, the polis, the, the fuzz. Uh, after one of the uh, you know, fights against a, a mob or a, a crew or a uh, a firm or something like that, well, I could plug things up at the back. You always, you always go through, you always run through, you always leg it, doing a lane. It's in football factories you see. I'm sorry, when I'm in when I'm in these fights for real, um, it's always a, a wee tight lane or a wee back alley that they they slip down. So I could plug up that back alley. You know, I could be the guy that hangs back at the rear and just use my girth to kind of plug up, like kind of a, a butt almost at the. At the rear, I don't know what my nickname would be, but probably something pretty cool. Hi folks, welcome to your Jersey Immediate Post-Match Reaction Pod, coming to you in association with Forest Precision Engineering and Football Prizes. My name's Alec Anderson, all my exes live in Texas, that's why I hang my hat in Tennessee. And I'm talking to you from a sun-blasted Ibrox after Rangers blasted Hibs, eventually by three goals to one in this afternoon's SPFL Premiership match. Let's hope that's a whitewash over Hibs for this season, hope we don't see them again. Um, and that's Philip Clement in his first game in charge of Rangers. It was a day like this. It was at the other end of the calendar. It was as um, autumn was becoming winter. It was a brilliantly sunny day. And now here we are as winter definitely dies off. We're very much into spring. A little taste of summer. Uh, again, our sunny Ibrox today. We're beating Hibs by three goals to one to go back to the top of that SPFL Premiership at the first time of asking after an interminable uh, an interminable international break, uh, the length of it compounded by the postponement of our game at Dens Park. The Rangers have got right back to it, right back to the top of the table, right back to beating what's in front of them. That is our first win. It's our first win in three games at Ibrox. It's the first three games at Ibrox that we haven't lost. Let's get things right if you're going to bum up this manager, Alec. I mean, this is a guy who in his press conference yesterday was saying that uh, nobody enjoyed COVID. We loved COVID. We loved the COVID period. 55, would somebody get this manager briefed? He was trying to tell folk yesterday that uh, that was the, when we lost one to Benfica, that was the first time that uh, he'd failed to score as Rangers manager. 0-0 uh, in Prague. I think I think we drew 0-0 in Prague. So I really don't know uh, what this guy's all about. He's got a lot to prove as far as I'm concerned. But uh, it's... Everyone's been prepared. That's, that's it. The, the music has been picked out. The balloons have been blown up. The little kind of the, the cloth bows that they do in the, in the backs of the chairs, they, they've all been tied up. Little, little bows, they look uh, really great. And the, the table has been has been laid out. And I wish Dad would just leave the dimmer switch alone. Leave it alone. The lights are perfect. All we're waiting for now is our esteemed guests from the east end of the city to turn up here for us to get the party going properly, for us to get stuck into stuff. We've got a week to cook that meal, and I'm really torturing this metaphor if it was even working in the first place. But the thing is, all we can really do today was make sure we are on point. We've got things as prepared as possible for the game that we'll see, ah, we hope, everything change. Um, whatever Celtic do tomorrow, they'll probably go back to the top of the league. They, they, they really need to. Uh, <laughs> they're away to Livingston, who are having a terrible season. Firmly at the bottom of the table. But whatever they do tomorrow, doesn't matter. We can go back to the top of the league by beating them next week. And what would be our first meaningful win over them in two whole seasons, really? And our first meaningful league win over them um, since the beginning of 2021-2022 season. Big Phil Hollander scoring, I think. Wouldn't it? Yeah, first properly meaningful league win over them. So, yeah. Everything really teed up for next week, and that's all we could ask from Rangers today. Ah, yeah, that's, it was a strange day. It was a strange day all around. It, what did you do during the international break? I went to internationals. I went to the under-21 game against Macedonia at Paisley, and I, I went to the, the game against Northern Ireland eh, on Tuesday night. So the international break, pretty staunch. You know, we did the Dutch uh, putting four past us uh, in, in Amsterdam, you know, the sons of William, you know, <laughs> the team from Orangi, and then it was God Save the King getting blasted out 
uh, on Tuesday night at Hamden, at the West End of Hamden, Union Jackson, and everywhere. So pretty staunch, and then I've got to come back today to this. You know, St Patrick's Day, the game's cancelled up at Dundee, and then today it's you know the team from Easter Road, named after the Isle of Ireland, the, the, the Roman name for the island of Ireland. So I uh, Easter Road. I was seven years old the first time I saw it. It was my very first Rangers game. It was 2nd of April 1977. My first Rangers game, the day I officially became a blue nose, uh, I was beaten by two goals to one. A guy called Bobby Smith, he scored the first goal I ever saw. Who Jock Wallace later signed him for Leicester City. He was quite impressed with me. He scored against us a couple of times that season, apparently. I was looking this up the other night. Uh, not the Bobby Smith who deliberately broke Eric Caldo's leg at, Hamden, uh, sorry, at Wembley in 1963, but... He scored the first goal I ever saw, a professional or senior goal I saw live in the flesh. I beat a few junior games before that, I think. But uh, Derek Parlane and Derek Johnson, they turned things round for Rangers to, to win that one 2 1. The crowd was 12,670. You take those digits from 12,670, adds up to 16, 1916, the Easter Rise, and the team from Easter Road. We're on the Easter weekend. I, I, I just can't be bored with this Rangers stuff. It's just so, you know, it's just so Irish, isn't it? You know, I'd rather support Scotland, whatever is nice and staunch. Uh, it was was hailstones yesterday in Glasgow for a wee period and then the sun came out it was lashing it down at about 10 o'clock this morning and then the sun came out and it was strange and things got stranger as the day went on. James Tavernier fell over a corner kick today he fell over a corner kick. The ball kind of sclaffed out for his gut. And I'm like, I've never seen that before. Uh, the stadium announcer told us that Tav had scored the first goal of the game after David Marshall had saved the penalty, which is how we got on. Last time we played Hibs, David Marshall saved the penalty and we scored for the rebound. But it was actually Scott Wright that had scored. And then the referee, once the stadium announcer, I think it was a new guy on the mic, the, the PA, the tannoy, whatever. Uh, once they got that right, the referee then disallowed it. This is a game in which I saw... I've never seen a referee pick the ball up so often. Two international goalkeepers, Scotland and England, at each end after an international week. But the referee had the ball in his hand more than either of those, more than both those goalkeepers combined. Right or wrong decisions, and I think there was a lot of wrong decisions today. I've never seen a ref pick up the ball so often in a professional football match. Uh, yeah, it was strange. It started off, we got the weather because of the sun. It's no t shirt weather yet, but it was uh, no wearing the jacket. I'm, I'm wearing the jacket and. Uh, kind of eagle-eyed viewers will realise we're wearing the same one for about three years ever since we've been doing these uh, post-match reaction pods this is my beaten uh, Leipzig in the semi-final of the Europa League uh, cagoule that I've got on £6, £7 I think maybe from that place at Decathlon they call it I, I think it was £7 it cost me so uh, that's probably why I didn't get any ICF but I a really, really, really weird game. Um, people were wearing these uh, the kind of jumpers and their, their training tops Rangers training tops and you've got these ones that are the castor ones that are blue, you know, almost a kind of navy blue, and it's the orange sleeves and the orange shoulders on them. So there was, because of the way the sun was kind of hitting the, the stands and what have you, I'm looking over and I thought, that's an orangutan. That's an orangutan over there. It was two guys over in the Brimlin. And I'm, I'm in the kind of Ibrook, the, 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 the Copeland end of the, the main stand. And they're both standing up. The, the whole uh, Brimlin is standing up, as it always does, down the front. And there's two boys... I stand there and they've got their arms folded. So it's like orange, and it was like the eyes of an orangutan. You know, like the, 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 the low brow and what have you. And I thought, that's an orangutan. But no, I don't mean anything against orangutans. Orangutan, I like orangutans. I went to see um, the Every Which Way But Loose. And Every Which Way You Can. I think it was the, two, the, the, the follow up to Clint Eastwood films with the orangutan. The orangutan. Um, I, I might see both of them at the pictures when I was a kid. And the orangutan was called Clyde. And Clyde was the. Uh, they, they beat Hibs in the 1958 Scottish Cup final, which was the last one to be shown live on telly. No, the MD had tellies in 1958 before the 1977 Scottish Cup final. You look at the crowd, 1976 Scottish Cup final was like 83,500 here. The capacity at uh, Hamden had been limited that, that week, but um, it was like it was busting at the seams. Following season, a year later, Old Firm final, Rangers playing Celtic in the, the Scottish Cup final, there's only like 50 odd thousand here because folk were just obviously thinking, yeah, beauty, can watch it in the house and, and get steaming in the house or watch it in the boozer. It's live on the telly. It was the first time it actually happened since 1958. Um, and uh, a month earlier, I went to my first Rangers game. Okay, sorry, it's been, that's me, bro. I needed to get out of my system. It's been a long couple of weeks uh, without talking about Rangers. I'm a wee bit backed up. But uh, it was strange a day. You also noticed with that, uh, a couple of other folk, orange things on, and it looked like Kenny. No, Kenny in um, was it South Park? They killed Kenny. 
It looked a bit like that as well. But anyway, it was Hibs that get killed the day. Well, I, I can invent a reason for, for getting that in there. It just, it really was, it was a weird uh, kind of set up the day. Weird things happening. And it was a bit like, you know, the calm before the storm. Rangers, not supposed to have one eye on next weekend. You've got to take it one game at a time. But it definitely was a feeling like that. I think the crowd was feeling like that as well. But the crowd did well. We were only 2-1 up in Hibs. Um, and they were starting to kind of hit us in the break, get a bit of pressure outside the box. Things were looking a bit ropey. It was a, a fantastic rendition of, you know, keeping things, keeping things Northern Irish, you know, build my gallows. And it went on for about five minutes. And I think it definitely got Rangers through that sticky spell. Uh, everybody's up for it. Everybody knows the significance of this season and we've got a fantastic chance of turning things round historically. You know, getting ourselves confirmed as being on the up and Celtic confirmed as being on the down. A, probably a season quicker than we could ever have expected when uh, we had to change manager. Back in October, uh, the wee sweepy guy is just completing the strangeness of the day, so excuse me while I shout into my furry microphone. That's not a euphemism. The team today, we had Jack Butland in goals, uh, James Tavernier, Captain Fantastic. We had him uh, at right back, of course. We had Conor Goldson, John Shooter back from international duty with Scotland. We had the, the guy that is going to Turkey, the left back that is going to Turkey, Borna Barisic, in, in place of the left back that we got from uh, Turkey, Ridvan Yilmaz. It was... Mr. Lundstrom and uh, Diamandi, the sitting two in midfielder, there was absolutely nothing sit sitting about either of them. Todd Cantwell, still coming back from injury, he was playing 10, you had a hole kind of thing, but he was coming back and making little triangles with Diamandi and um, Lundstrom, which proved very useful on the left-hand side of the attacking three. It was Silva, uh, Fabio Silva, back from scoring for the Portugal under 21s, a couple of assists as well, apparently during the week. On the right hand side, it was Scott Wright, and in the middle, centre forward, up front, Serial Dessers, uh, back from having a, a big miss for Nigeria. So, aye, it was uh, a good team we had out there. The, the, the great news for me, amongst other things, I see it roof, wasn't he, on the bench, but uh, the good Lord gives and the good Lord takes away. Uh, what he'd given us was Seema, Seema back on the bench for Rangers, and it was lovely to see Abdallah Seema, an absolute goal machine, a fantastic player, and a massive miss. Um, for anybody, although you know we've done really well without him, I, I thought it'd be an absolute disaster when Seema got his injury at Afcon. But yeah, we've, we've coped reasonably well with him. We might still be in Europe if we had no loss. But anyway, let's not think about that. The main thing is we were out there today and uh, great pace. Started off absolutely fantastic. Uh, started off looking looking the business. Uh, it wasn't quite happening. I think it was about eight, nine minutes before Hibbs managed to get up around the park. They kind of messed about at the edge of our box. Connor Golson uh, beats down a, a, a lame shot from the edge of the box. I think that was it from Hibbs for the first half, half hour, really. And we had a few kind of wild. I think John Lundstrom had a kind of dipping shot from outside the box. It wasn't it? We're looking sharp enough. We're looking well up for it, but there was no real execution. There was no real cutting edge. Um, and then it all started going. <laughs> Really weird. We got this penalty. Somebody was cleared out. There was a free kick or a corner we had into the box. Maybe 20 minute mark. And I noticed straight away um, one of our players getting absolutely cleared out. I can't even remember who the player was. Sorry, I'm, the nerves have been getting to me today. But uh, it went back to. It looked like a. It looked like a foul. And it went back to VR. Sorry, there's folk kind of shouting at each other here, getting excited outside the football ground. I just. I don't really. Don't really like that. And that's probably why I couldn't get in the ICF. But. Somebody get cleared out in the box, um, and the play went on, and the referee eventually kind of held things up, VAR, blah, 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 long story short, it's a penalty, and up steps James Tavernier against David Marshall, as he did in the Scottish Cup a few weeks ago, and again, David Marshall saves it, comes back out, and it gets lashed in the net by Scott Wright, the stadium announcer then announces it as being James Tavernier that scored the goal, and everybody's like, what? And then he announces it as being Scott Wright. We all have a laugh and we cheer on Scott Wright, who must have been thinking, what have I got to do to get a goal? Well, it turned out uh, a lot more to, to get the credit for a goal. He didn't even get the goal because it was rolled out for. Uh, well, well, the referee puts his hand... Uh, the, thing, the VAR thing's coming on the screen that's saying possible encroachment, right? So he's going into the box too early. I, don't, I couldn't see how quickly he got in the box for the replay. It's one of the things we'll see on sports scene uh, for the rebound. But like some, uh, encroachment, VAR, possible encroachment. And then the referee seemed to... To signal for offside, and we're trying to wonder what is it? Maybe it's just the way he signalled it. It'll be explained. I'm not going to get too heavy critical on the ref because you know I had no idea what was going on. Like I say, I can't even remember who it was. It was cleared out in the box, um, but it was disallowed. And you're thinking, ah, oh, Christ, is it going to be one of those days? Because I always think that. And the uh, next thing we're 
I think John Lundstrom was just thinking to himself, the crowd are getting confused, these folk pay your wages, and there's obviously a bit of cognitive dissonance going on there, they're a bit upset, they're trying to work out what the hell's happening, the PA announcer's confusing things, I'm just going to make life really simple for them again. Doing the wing, pinged an absolute belter of a ball uh, in the box, he goes down the left, John Lundstrom, never mind Barris, it's never mind Silva, I'll take care of this, down the left hand side and fires a fantastic ball, a really dangerous, awful ball for the Hibs defence, and they managed to get a kind of half-hearted clearance on it, out to the edge of the box, and in comes Tav, like like a fullback following up a penalty, um, rebounded with maximum encroachment and slams it first time right across the carpet into the bottom. Bottom corner of the pokey hat, a fantastic goal before we even had a chance to get worried about the penalty miss and encroachment or whatever it was. Uh, absolutely, before we even had a chance to think Tav's confidence make it dented ahead of next week and like that, it just, that's it, smash, one nothing. everything's great. So we thought, until it got to the point where the referee gave seven minutes of injury time you know, at half time, but it's come up to the, was the, the end of the, the first half, 45 minutes on the clock, referee's given seven minutes of injury time, we're thinking, I suppose it was, there was a lot of huffing and puffing, waiting for the penalty to be awarded and then deciding if there'd been encroachment for the rebound after the penalty, blah, blah, blah. But it kind of made everybody feel a bit strange. And I think it made Rangers feel a bit strange as well. And next thing, Hibs equalised. We had a really strange goal. I don't know. It was a, one of the kind of slow motion car crashes. I only took note of things going wrong when John Lundstrom kind of reprising his... Again, on the left hand side, doing maximum damage to Hibs up, <laughs> up uh, the other, the, the Brimland end of the left hand side, and now back towards the Copeland end of the left hand side. I, I don't know if he's the most culpable, but he seemed to kind of slow down and thought, I'm not going to bother trying to catch this guy. And then the ball, uh, John Souter kind of got closer to it, uh, but still get past him, and then uh, it's. Jack Butland's coming out and he's even closer, but the fella gets a put. Is that kind of is it a catalogue of mistakes of lessening um, culpability, if you like, it's smaller and smaller mistakes? But somewhere, somewhere it all went completely wrong. Run about uh, John Lundstrom, no tracking the guy back as he didn't do in Cyprus. Remember that Aris Limassol, one of their goals. It was a bit like that. <laughs> Lonnie was great today. I just that was one moment things seemed to go kind of badly wrong. Maybe he's thinking I'll get myself back to the base of midfield for when this ball's inevitably cleared. Inevitably cleared. I'll need to be there to start another attack from it. But it did look like he was kind of just uh, abdicating his responsibility. Anyway, long, long and short of it was Hibs scored their first goal against us in four attempts this season, four games this season, and I uh, think it just be like the bloody thing. We've beaten them. I was thinking that when we beat them four nothing, then we beat them three nothing, then we beat them two nothing. The Scottish Cup. I was thinking today it might, it might just be one nothing, but no, it wasn't going to be that. It was one each, and I think I saw, oh, this is bad. We're too busy concentrating in the Celtic game. We're going to chuck it before we even get a chance to play them. And straight back up the park, did it again. <laughs> straight back up the park, Rangers, and it was uh, Todd Cantwell who'd been getting really involved, displaying lots of skill. Todd Cantwell, but maybe a bit like a player who, like him, is coming back from a, a, a you know, a fairly lengthy injury. Try to play himself, but he's had a lot of game time over the last few weeks. Try to play himself back in. He was taking a lovely, like, for example, taking the ball out of the air with one touch, controlling it straight away, and then knocking it straight to a Hibs player. <laughs> that kind of stuff. It wasn't, he, it wasn't he by any means perfect. He was definitely trying, but what a, a fantastic ball he fired from the right hand side, right across the front of the six yard box, and just in between crossbar and six yard line if you like and then goes serial dessers with I, I know I've got a lot of finishes that's the kind of goal I love I think there's about 238 different types of goal that I love any Rangers goal I love but that is a classic I love that just a fantastically fierce ball across the front of the goal and a centre forward throwing himself in there with a, against the goalie with two centre halves either side of him and just slapping his head against that thing like a big shovel hitting a tennis ball and it went to the, the back of the pokey hat crack and goal Rangers 2-1 up and seemingly having to you know, weather the storm and, and turn things round. This is on this is two goals scored. We can see the equaliser and then we take the lead again all in the space of first half injury time, albeit that it was seven minutes of it. So that was really encouraging that we'd done that. Came into the second half and after about five, ten minutes of the second half, it's pretty clear that Todd Cantwell had run his race. Uh, hopefully he's going to be okay for next week. I think it was just it's, it's just going to be uh, tiredness really coming back from injury. On came uh, one only Tom Lawrence for Todd Cantwell. Who else come on at that point? Was that when we brought on Rabbi Matondo? No, I think we brought on uh, Dujon Sterling, Mr. Utility Man. Again, he comes on for like, he comes on just before the hour mark and still manages to play two different positions <laughs> before the end of the game. So he came on on the right hand side initially as we took off uh, Scott Wright. Doing well, Scott Wright. He's getting himself back into playing well for Rangers. 
Uh, you get yourself back up to pace. Uh, he comes in for, for Scott Wright and we had, we had chances, but run about the hour mark, just after the hour. Tav, you know, fantastic anticipation. He gets uh, beyond the, the Hibs back line, latches onto a ball, just at the edge of the, like in a, the Copeland hand. The, the Copeland end, that's the fuck we're, we're shooting towards the Copeland second half. It's two weeks away for doing these things. I'm totally rusty as anything. He, he plays the ball from the wing, the or right hand side, into the box, picks out Cyril Dessers, an absolute cracker. I don't know if Dessers had his back to his back to goal at that point in time, but he certainly has to spin anyway and from I don't know, run about six yards, he puts it past the post when it seemed easier to score, as they say. A dreadful miss. And again, you know, that fatalistic thing about you, is that going to be the one that costs us? Is that going to be, you know, is that going to come back to bite us in the backside? Or Hibs going to equalise and that'll be the miss that, that turned this game around. And Hibs did start getting up towards our box, but after a lot of kind of huffing and puffing and a bit of stressing from the supporters, which we quickly turned into this kind of five minute burst of, say, build my gallows. Uh, Bill My Gallows High, I don't actually know the name, the name of the song, I'm not into all that stuff really, you know, just <laughs> my, my throat's sore for other reasons. Uh, we we get the winner, 3-1, Rabbi Matondo had come on the part, it was kind of bleeding, a slow drip of the uh, substitutes during the second half. Rabbi Matondo, uh, out on the left hand side at this point, Ross McCausland's on the right hand side and Dujon Sterling eventually went to left back and we took off Borna Barisic. And uh, Rabbi Matondo just gets us both on the right-hand side and cuts in. And again, it's like it's almost like there's been too much huffing and puffing, too much fanning about. This is what you do. Just slam the thing into the top corner from the edge of the box. A fantastic finish. What was that? Ten minutes to go, maybe 80-odd minutes? And that was it. It seemed to be pretty much in the bag. The only worry thereafter was uh, Tav went down. Four or five minutes of injury time given by the ref. Tav goes down. Just one of those, I've sat down, like my hammy's gone or something, and we old firm games, just for as long as I can remember, since I was a lad, in the past 47 years of supporting Rangers, before an old firm game we always get a suspension, or we get a major injury, and we've been getting major injuries all bloody season, so I hope, I hope Tav is okay, he got back up, we'd used all our subs by that point in time, he just went off for a quick bit of treatment, uh, and he was back on the park for the, the, the final two or three minutes. It seemed to be okay, so it's just it's just a bit chilling to see our most consistent player, our fittest player, a guy who's never injured, uh, the last gasket in the Rangers machine you ever want to see blown as James Tavernier, but it's so unusual to see him just being injured in any way uh, that it gives a bit of a fright. But that's not something we can say for the Hibs players today. They were constantly injured. One of the other weird things that happened today was right early on, I forgot to mention this, the Hibs did a free kick and they were trying to take it so quickly deep in their own half, just outside their own box. They, whoever took it leveled it right into the face of another Hibs player. It kind of almost knocked him out and it bounced back to hit off the face of the player who'd taken the free kick. Everybody instinctively tittered because it just looked so funny. But straight away, Todd Cantwell is down there saying, this guy's been knocked out, let's get... It wasn't, it was okay. Um, I don't know the names of any Hibs players, to be honest. Uh, I really don't like Hibs. But uh, I, the, Todd Cantwell, straight away, this guy's got to be attended to. We just, no interested in the ball. And uh, being sporting is something that uh, you shouldn't have to talk about. It's just something you do. But Hibs, I don't know how many times their players just hit the deck after that. The same thing as a hangover from that Scottish Cup game where um, Martin Boyle, the one player whose name I do know, and you're going to get a hat-trick against at Hamden, yes, I will eventually remember that name. Uh, he got himself knocked out uh, the, the Cup game a few weeks ago at Easter Road. And I don't like to talk about this, but our, player, our, our medical staff come on, just being medical staff, they don't care about what colours you're wearing, doing everything they could to help a guy who'd clearly been seriously concussed. And that game ends up with our medical staff um, coming on to help Ross McCausland, who was injured, getting pushed off the park by Hibs players. And I feel that's a bit, a bit rich. And then today, the same thing happened. You know, Todd Cantwell, no interested in the ball after that. Just This guy's been knocked out. Let's get him attended to it. He wasn't knocked out. He was fine to continue. But we didn't have Hibs again during the game. Going down, just stopping. And the referee kept picking the ball up. I spent my whole life defending referees because the abuse they get is absolutely terrible. It's like a kind of bigotry. It's like everybody in the country can hate referees. And you know, the mainstream commentators and what have you as well, match of the day, sports scene, everybody can just lay into referees. Oh, they're just incompetent. It's an absolute disgrace. You know, never get credit for what they do correctly. Um, and I, I find it a bit... You know, I was at a non-league game again uh, last, last Saturday. Uh, the FD actually was, was really good and was no abuse whatsoever, but that's a rarity these days. Uh, but the day I couldn't help myself, it's just the bias. It's just, I mean, maybe every decision he made was absolutely fine, but it seemed like Hibs players were just sitting down 
a couple of times when they were under serious pressure, they would just go down and they, they would get the ball back. And we would be told, it would be the kind of drop ball that we were more or less told to get out the way. At one point it happened, that's fine, the guys have clearly been concussed or whatever, but they sh we should have been getting the ball back after that. We kind of stopped play for them, we were kind of through on goal, because they made such an arse of that free kick, but our players weren't interested, more interested in, in looking after their, a fellow professional football player who'd been knocked out. Um, I think the referee took his lead from that moment. He, he gave Hibbs the ball, more or less letting him retake the free kick. And I got to the point where deep in the second half, was it was it Sima who'd come on? I remember Abdallah Sima, he looked very tentative. Obviously, he came on for Dessels. He looked a bit tentative, but I don't know that much me kind of transposing what I felt about Abdallah Sima. I wanted him to be tentative. Just just get your legs going again, Abdallah. Don't get too involved in there. Don't be messing about with any big burly centre halves that are picking themselves about uh, kind of petulantly. Keep yourself fresh for next week. Uh, but I, I think he was in the box and he got fouled and down he went. But a Hibs player, no, we're, no, we're just through and go. We're just kind of at the edge of the Hibs box, lining up a shot, and a Hibs player just decided to sit down. Just sat down, you know, and every one of these Hibs players was okay to continue within two or three seconds. They never even went off the park. Half them. So it was a really, really strange one. Uh, the, the referee picking the, the ball up so often in a game. I have never seen it like that before. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a rusty post match, folks. I'll be uh, a much better one coming to you from Craig and Scott of Jersnet. They'll be doing one from inside iBox just now. So get on to that if you haven't done so already. Craig will be back tomorrow night. Sunday hosting the, the marquee, the flagship pod. Uh, it'll be himself, Ross and Doogie. So that's going to be an absolute belter. Definitely get yourself involved with that one, folks. Half past nine live on the YouTube channel. Me, I am off ski. I won't be back. Uh, you'll be glad to hear after this pathetic effort for... Um, uh, about two and a half weeks before the, uh, just just before the, the semi final against Hearts at Hamden, and it's quite weird that you know, did you see the ICF flags today. That was nothing. It was ICF were having about a flag day up the the, the back of the governor that the flags were coming out over the the old balcony, uh, bar seventy two balcony at the front of the the Govan rear there, and somebody was telling me it's a, their fortieth anniversary. As I say, I never really. Uh, uh, wasn't much of a contender. It did, the one thing the ICF did for me though was uh, the one time I did follow them like a, a stupid wee alarm and um, try to pretend I was a hard case. Uh, it was at New Year's 1987 and they went to, we went to Fur Park. I've, I've seen this written in a book now. I, I did not, I did not just read this in a book and I'm now pretending that it happened. I'm telling you, I'm a total shite bag when it comes to the fighting. I am useless at fighting. Couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag. I pretty soon discovered that uh, the, the casual stuff wasn't for me, but I remember uh, going to Fur Park, everybody's in Central Station, and it came across you know, uh, uh, the radio or whatever that the game had been cancelled because uh, of the snow. And it was, it was early January 1987, we'd just beaten Celtic. Uh, on the 1st of January 87 as soon as standing in the ball and all that me and my mates were going absolutely mental at that one that was great I was only like you know, 17, 18 at the time and it announced that our next game at Fur Park was off so the ICF the top boys like let's head out to Parkhead they were at home to Hamilton Aki's that day and we all went and we went on the Celtic end you know <laughs> on the Celtic end and uh, it's not that we took the Celtic end the poll has pretty soon discovered who we were what was happening and kind of saved our lives uh, and got us on to the, the track side so I got escorted on the track at Parkhead and we get put in with the Hamilton Ackies fans but that game finished 8-3 to Celtic it was the highest scoring top flight game uh, I think since the, the the change to the, the Premier Division back in 1975-76. So I'll always be grateful to the ICF uh, for enticing me, <laughs> for me uh, finding them exciting enough to get me to a, a statistic. I, I pretty soon learned that I was just a kind of stats man and it was good to be involved in that one. I can say I was at the, the highest scoring game in the top flight for quite some time. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll not be here um, next week. I, would, I, would, I wanted them to be called H. I thought HMS was quite good, and it was always every time you were invited to a party, it was the same thing. You know, smart casual, smart casual. I, just, I like the black tie, you know. So the, the ICF wasn't for me, but yeah, I'll, I'll be away, and that's. Uh, probably good for you not just because my part is so absolutely chronic as you're, as you're suddenly remembering why did I tune back in to watch this fact get but um, I think things need to change it's going to be a massive significant change as I was saying earlier 
if we beat Celtic, it's obviously fantastic for the the title race this season. It puts us in prime position for the treble, but it's also a kind of historic thing. It would it'd be our second title since 2012, and to take it at a time where Celtic, not that we'd be taking it next week, no matter. If Livingston pays Celtic tomorrow, and we pay Celtic next week. Still far from uh, far from finished. There'll be lots of ups and downs because we are a team, as I've said before, uh, who are given that we're all the ponderous moments today. Uh, despite great application, fantastic focus from this Rangers team, it's because we're completely unfit. We've got a manager who is working us into the ground, getting everything from everyone, but he's got a team that weren't trained properly in pre-season. So that is still going to cause uh, a, just a, a, kind of a basic imbalance uh, in our vibe, if you like, but it's going to get players injured as well. So it's it's, it's far from over if we, if we win next week, but... It, I feel as if it feels like a proper change. You know, there's a change in the air, as the song says. And it's wee things like that. You know, I have never done a post-match reaction pod. No one in Jersnet has done a post-match reaction pod for a significant win, a meaningful win over Celtic. And it's always meaningful when you beat Celtic. We thought that 3-0 win at Ibrox last season when myself and Colin did do a post-match reaction pod. It uh, was laying down a marker, was setting the tone. That was uh, Michael Beale saying just exactly what he was going to do once he's a full pre-season and he's, uh, he's on transfer kitty. But no, uh, it didn't, it didn't turn it that way at all. We were doing, Colin started, he called invented the post-match reaction pods, Colin Armstrong. He invented the post-match reaction pods for Jersnet. It was maybe three seasons ago now, and I remember I was doing a few of them with them, 2021, 2022 season. Of course, we eventually went, we went mad with the, the European ones. But when we beat Celtic in the Scottish Cup semi-final, Colin wasn't there because he doesn't. He objects to the, the, the My Jersey thing, and I can I definitely see his point in that one. Uh, so he didn't have a ticket for that semi-final. I didn't want to do it on my own at that point in time. <laughs> You wish I hadn't, hadn't started doing them on, I know. But so we didn't do a, a post match reaction pod after that one. Um, we weren't doing them at the time. The earlier that season, we beat them in the league, which is the last time we've beaten them meaningfully in the league. Big Hollander scored the goal 2021 2022 season, Christ. But aye, so it's just that kind of change. It's, it's incremental when there's a massive change. I mean, it would be a massive change for us to win the league this season, and it would be centered around this game next week. I always go back to Andy Murray. It's like when Andy Murray, we were, can Andy Murray win a major? Can he win Wimbledon? And remember, they get beat off Federer and he's crying and all that kind of thing. But then a few months later, he's back and it was the Olympics. It was the Olympics tennis tournament. It was at Wimbledon, but it was the Olympics bunting kind of livery all around Wimbledon. And it was only two sets, I think. It was shorter games. So he beats Federer in the final of that. And he's winning a gold medal. So he's winning, he's beating Federer at Wimbledon, but he's no one Wimbledon. And then he's won the US Open, and then, you know, it was the following year he did actually, it was Djokovic who beat the final, but it was like, it doesn't just change overnight, it becomes gradually more believable. And the way this manager has got us playing, um, the focus he's got in this team, and the players he's getting back from injury today as well, the fact he's got another seven, eight days, sorry, to, to let this little win bed in properly. It makes you believe in wee things like this big fat face of mine, no being talking to you after yet another all firm game. Every time I have spoken to you after an all firm game, it's been at best a draw, you know, or, or at best a, a win uh, when there was nothing left to play for in the season anyway, it was already done. That's another one of those little changes. It makes me believe, you know, I'm not going to be around to say next week, I'm not even going to be at the game, so we're definitely going to win it. Four, five, six, nothing. And uh, I hope you folks absolutely love it, really enjoy it. Uh, thanks for your patience again, and I'll see you middle April.